Good morning, Crossbridge Church. Welcome to our online service. We are so happy that you're here to join us. Today, we're continuing our new series called Wanderers and Wrestlers, which is based off the book of Genesis. We're gonna be going through that in the summer, but before we hear from Pastor Sam in just a moment, we wanna let you know that we have a ton of amazing events coming up this summer, a lot of worship events, a lot of time, house parties, family events that we really want you to be a part of. And if you wanna connect with us, you can go ahead and download our app. It's available in the App Store. All you have to do is search up Crossbridge Miami Springs, and it's a great way for us to connect with you. We want to get to know you, and we want you to be a part of our community. So we can't wait to see you at these upcoming events this summer. And church, that is all for today. So now let us worship together.
Well, Abram and Sarai doubted God's ability to fulfill his own word and decided to take matters into their own hands. And again, we'll see that whenever we do that, the product will be nothing but chaos. In today's episode of our current summer series, Wrestlers and Wanderers, hopefully we'll learn that true freedom is not the absence of restrictions or the absence of confinement, but it's staying within the boundaries and structures that God has made over our lives in order for us to be blessed by Him. And so if you have your Bibles, uh, please turn with me to Genesis chapter 16. So I'll be reading the entire chapter. God's Word says this, Now Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children, but she had an Egyptian slave named Hagar. So she said to Abram, The Lord has kept me from having children. Go sleep with my slave. Perhaps I can build a family through her. Well, Abram agreed to what Sarai said. So after Abram had been living in Canaan 10 years, Sarai, his wife, took her Egyptian slave Hagar and gave her to her husband to be his wife. He slept with Hagar and she conceived. When she knew she was pregnant, she began to despise her mistress. And Sarai said to Abram, you are responsible for the wrong I am suffering. I put my slave in your arms and now that she knows she's pregnant, she despises me. May the Lord judge between you and me. Your slave is in your hands, Abram said. Do with her whatever you think it's best. And Sarai mistreated Hagar, so she fled from her. The angel of the Lord found Hagar near a spring in the desert. It was the spring that it beside the road to Shur. And he said, Hagar, slave of Sarai, where have you come from and where are you going? I'm running away from my mistress, Sarai, she answered. Then the angel of the Lord told her, Go back to your mistress and submit to her. The angel added, I will increase your descendants so much that they will be too numerous to count. The angel of the Lord also said to her, You are now pregnant and you will give birth to a son. You shall name him Ishmael. For the Lord has heard your misery. He will be a wild donkey of a man. His hand will be against everyone and everyone's hand against him. And he will live in hostility towards all of his brothers. She gave this name to the Lord who spoke to her, You are the God who sees me, for she said, I have now seen the one who sees me. That's why the well was called Beer Lahai Roy. It's still there between Kadesh and Bered. So Hagar bore Abram a son, and Abram gave the name Ishmael to the son she had born. Abraham was 86 years old when Hagar bore him Ishmael. You know, one of the things that we teach our kids from a very young age that it's not polite to point at people and stare at people and and that you know don't stare at people grows into don't see and don't see grows into habits of not seeing what obviously is seen and we don't see people who are different than us people who are maybe in pain or 
people who are maybe suffering or people who are maybe uh, experiencing some handicaps or people who are homeless or maybe people in our own home that we, we just take for granted. Being invisible, being not noticed, uh, it's not a good feeling. And, and some of us, or if not all of us, have felt that at one point in our lives. Some, you know, things are going well and all of a sudden the bottom drops out and, and in the midst of all of the confusion, we ask ourselves, God, where are you? Where's God in my, my affliction? This must have been what uh, Hagar must have felt, a terrible feeling as she would run away from Sarai. I mean, things were looking up for a minute for, for Hagar when Abram you know, uh, took her in and they conceived a child uh, for his barren wife, which was something that was totally legal and customary at that time. But then she began to despise her mistress, maybe giving off a sense of superiority because her, you know, her invisible status had changed for the first time in her life. And Sarai responded, you know, uh, treating her harshly. And the situation got so bad, apparently uh, Hagar had to escape in tough terrain with few supplies. And this is where, this is where we find her, feeling abandoned. I mean, where, where was she going to go? The Bible tells us that she took the road to shore, so which probably indicated that she was trying to probably get back to Egypt. But where would a single pregnant mom go? Does she have any family there? And if she did, were they poor? I mean, this is a mess. She finds herself in chaos. A past that's probably too painful to think about. A future that's probably too uncertain. She's abandoned. She's feeling alone. She's feeling absolutely uh, uh, desperate. Everyone on earth has left her. And knowing about Abram's God, she's probably wondering if that God knows where she is or even cares about her situation. Now, I want to encourage everyone, I want everyone to know, if you're watching, I want you to know that the same God who saw Hagar sees you. He absolutely sees you where you are. He knows what you're going through as his knowledge of you is very personal and very, very persistent. And because God sees you, You've got to believe that he's got a plan and a purpose for your life, whether you're working that job that you don't like, you know, overworked, underpaid, whether you've got that husband that has now walked out on you or that wife that doesn't appreciate you or those kids that are turning out to be not the way you thought they would turn out to be. Whatever it is, God sees you. I believe it's Jeremiah the prophet that says that God has plans for you, plan to prosper you, He's got a future. He's got a hope. They're not plans to, to, to harm you. But within that plan, there's some boundaries. There's some restrictions. There's some structures that God places over our lives for our benefit. And I'm just going to bring three reasons that God does this. I'll draw them out from the text. First, when boundaries come down, chaos is born. Notice in verse 9, the angel of the Lord finds Hagar and he tells her, go back to your mistress and submit to her. Now imagine Hagar asking questions like, but God, don't you know that I was mistreated there? Don't you know that it was a bad situation? Don't you know how, how can't you bless me first? And then maybe I'll think about, uh, you know, going back and doing what you're telling me to do. I thought, I thought you were, I thought your word was supposed to set me free and change me and change my situation. And Hagar must have been confused for a moment, but whenever God's word speaks to us in our moments of affliction. Remember that the number one need at that moment in our lives is to humble ourselves, for us to humble ourselves under God's guidance. Because it's under God's guidance that it was better for Hagar to go back to live with Abram and Sarai. Even if, even if Sarai was harsh with her, it was, it was better for her to go back to raise her son in the house of the father of faith than for her to go to, back to Egypt, which God was probably preventing her from, from even worse damage because he not only sees our current situation, he not only sees our today, he not only sees our present, but he also sees our future once that affliction is over. So God tells her to go back, tells her to name her firstborn Ishmael, which means the God who hears. He was hearing her distress and hearing her cries and she would name both God and the spring here after her experience and the, the idea is that Hagar saw the God who saw her need and answered and was merciful to her need in spite of her shortcomings and when we're in our affliction and it seems like God has 
forgotten us. It seems like he's not answering our prayers. He's just not in the room. We need to learn to trust in his guidance and not to trust in our own human schemes to try to make things happen. Placing ourselves under God's provision, under God's boundaries for our benefit. That is our first response. For example, if you're a, if you're a teenager, God has placed parents over your lives. If you're married, God has placed a spouse for you to go to. If you're, if you're uh, uh, not committed to a local church yet, you need to commit yourself to where Christ is being honored, His Word is, is being preached, and you need to submit yourself to the leadership and guidance under that uh, church, even though that boundary may, may or may not be perfect. In fact, a lot of times they're not perfect. A lot of times they're imperfect. Because once you break down these provisional boundaries that God has established over your lives, you cannot control the outcome. You cannot control what crosses over the rubble. You cannot control what comes into your house. And now, you, now you've got yourself into an experience, and that experience grows up into a belief, and that belief grows up into now, hey, this is my truth. No, it's not your truth. It's the consequences of your failures, of your choices. For Sarai, she failed. She failed to factor in God's promise that he made to Abram. And so she rests on her human ingenuity and her human schemes here. And now Hagar's operating as, as if she's something more than a maid because she was asked to do something than just make the bed. And she couldn't control, Sarai couldn't control the effect because once you open that door, you have no control what comes through that. For, for, for uh, Hagar, she begins to hate Sarai. Again, she probably feels a sense of superiority. Her status has changed. She's walking around with a pep in her step. But she couldn't control the effect of how Sarai was going to respond and, and react to her. And for Abram, he washes his hand like Pontius Pilate of the whole situation without weighing the implications. And now you have a chaotic situation because whenever boundaries come down, chaos is born. The good news is this. That when we submit to God's direction for our lives, in the midst of our affliction, in spite of our confusion, in spite of the fact that sometimes we rebel against God, He lets us get a glimpse of Himself. We need to see a God who is merciful to us in spite of our sin, as He finds Hagar here in her chaos, directs her in the way that she needed to go, not the way that she thought she should go, and promises her blessings as long as she submits to his ways and not hers. And I wonder, do we see a merciful God in the moments of our deep struggle and deep affliction? Do we, do we see a God who knows our thoughts and wants to engage in our anxieties and wants to engage in our discouragements? Are we grateful when God meets us at our lowest moments and finds us in our in our uh, depression or finds us when we're feeling left alone or finds us when we're feeling left behind. If so, we have to submit to his guidance. That's the proper response when we see God and we see his mercy towards us in Christ Jesus. As the psalmist would say when he says this in Psalm 139, he writes, How precious also are your thoughts to me, O God. How vast is the sum of them. And here's the second reason God places these uh, provisions, these boundaries, these restrictions over us is because good boundaries produce freedom, not control. Good boundaries produce freedom, not control. Verse 10, angel says, go back. And then he promises, if you do, your descendants will increase so much they'll be too numerous to even count. And through all of the discipline that we'll ever go through life, we got to believe that God has a purpose of unfailing love and unfailing wisdom within His providence. Because we'll often confuse freedom with, with control. That's the tension. That's the, what we wrestle with. It's what we struggle with. We, we were created to live by the standard of God, not by the standard of self, not by the standard of our culture, because our culture defines freedom or sees freedom in negative terms. Freedom is... Uh, the absence of being confined. That's how our culture defines freedom. The absence of being constrained. Our culture would read this and say, well, Hagar's on the run. Good for her. She's finally free from that crazy woman. Is she, though? Is she really free? Because if you're seeking to be self-sufficient, apart from God, to determine what's right and wrong, to determine what's good and evil for yourself, what constrains you now is not freedom, it's fear. 
And fear will drive you and lead you to, to being controlled by a thousand different desires and lead you into slavery too strong for us to even break out of. True freedom is about finding the right constraints. It's about finding the liberating restrictions like a well-rehearsed musician, like a good, disciplined uh, athlete. Even if you find yourself not having a lot of influence, not having a lot of money, not having a lot of uh, 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 status, even if you think you're invisible, even if you're listening and you think, you know what, I'm just an unlovable person. Everybody, everybody who is created in the image and likeness of God is carrying within them a part of God's plan, a part of God's purpose. And within that, God has set structures and boundaries over our lives not to control us, but to produce in us a true freedom. And the evidence that we're free, the evidence that we're free is that God's Word is making an advance in our hearts. It's taking a place in our lives. It's transforming us. It's, it's changing us. And we find ourselves believing, hey, God does see me. God does love me. God does find me in these places. And our response should be obedience to what He wants us to do, obedience to His will. The tragedy now is that fear is the response of the human conscience in the presence of God. Going back to Genesis 1 in the garden when God is looking for Adam and he asks Adam, where are you? Much like the angel is asking Hagar, what are you doing here? Adam's response is, I heard the sound of you coming and I, and I was afraid. That's the tragedy. That fear is the response of the human mind towards the presence of God. And now the world is plunged into identifying with everything other than God. Now the world believes that they're the Alpha and the Omega of their own lives. They're the ground and the resource of their own happiness. And guess what? They'll never succeed in achieving that. They'll never succeed in achieving true freedom. There's a story that I'm reminded of in the book of Acts. It uh, highlights this sequence where Peter's asleep. He's in, he's in the jail and an angel comes to visit. Here's what Luke's right, uh, Luke says in Acts chapter 12. He says this, Suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared, and a light shone in the cell. Talking about the jail cell. He struck Peter on the side and woke him up. Quick, get up, he said. And the chains fell off Peter's wrists. Then the angel said to him, Put on your clothes and sandals. And Peter did so. Wrap your cloak around you and follow me, the angel told him. Now, you would think the natural sequence of of this order would be that the chains would fall off Peter's wrist and then Peter would get up, but that's not how it happened. The angel said Peter got up and then the chains fell off Peter's wrist. See, we think, we, we think that if we're not restricted and if we're not constrained, we, we, it's going to get easier. We're going we're gonna to feel free and then we can obey God. God, if you could just adjust this situation, then, I, then it'll be easier to, to give and to, of my time and my talents and, and, of my, uh, and of my treasures. No, but if you obey God, the sequence is then chains fall off because obedience comes before freedom. Freedom from what? Freedom from needing to know the outcome before we take the next step. Just remember, faith is the, the, the substance of things, hope for the evidence of things not seen. Faith gets dressed like Peter here, even though you don't know where you're going. Even though you don't know all the details, I'm just going to follow God. I'm following uh, the path of God's mercy for me because you don't have to be in a literal prison, in a literal cell to be constrained. You don't have to be in literal chains to be confined and restricted. Addiction can be a prison. Isolation can be a prison. Uh, not engaging in meaningful relationships could be a prison. Concealing things and hiding things from other people can be a prison. And all you need all you need at that moment is the next thing that God wants you to do because you can never predict the path of freedom. Never. You can only respond to the light that shines in our prison. You can only respond to the Word as proof that we trust God. Whenever we're not trusting God, or as Peter, he's half asleep here, he doesn't fully understand. Hagar. Going back to her, the next step for her was to believe in God's promises, to go back to the place where she was running from, more so than believing that she was a worthless, unlovable, unseen slave that nobody cared about. Here's the last uh, restriction and boundary that God places over our lives that we often struggle with. Boundaries help clarify our responsibility. What if God places your provisions in the place of trouble. 
What if God promises you the promised land behind the walls of Jericho? What if, what if God puts your blessings in the hands of someone who doesn't appreciate you? What if God is leading you down a path that's not exactly what you had in mind, but that's where he put the bread, and that's where he places the water, and that's where he places the blessing, and you're never going to get those provisions until you go back into this uncomfortable place of growth. Hagar goes back. The God who sees her is telling her to go back to the woman who doesn't. It's tough. And Hagar goes back, not because she thought Sarai was going to have a change of heart, but, but because God saw her. And if God sees you, and if God sees us, then we can deal with people not seeing us. We can deal with people not acknowledging us and ignoring us, or we can, we can deal with people making our job harder than, than, it, than it ought to be, because all we need is the knowledge that we're not forgotten, we're not seen by the omniscient and all-seeing God. You imagine this moment, Hagar comes back, knock, knock, knock. Sarai answers, who's there? Hagar say, uh, uh, it's me. Sarai says, me who? It's me, Hagar. Sarai's like, what are you doing back here? And Hagar's like, I don't know, God told me to come back here, and this is the place that, that you know, I'm, I'm going to be. It's the place where he puts me. You know, it's uncomfortable. And later we'll read that Abraham, right, calls his son Isaac on Mount Moriah. He calls on the Lord Jehovah Jireh. And it was here in the place of, of discomfort that he discovers God's provision. God provided for him a ram. This is a question of, of ethics. How we're going to behave, how we're going to uh, uh, respond, especially when we're, when we're struggling here, when we're struggling to understand what's the right thing to do, what's the wrong thing to do, what's the right, what's the wrong. In any given moment, for Abram and Sarai, they, they weakened in their faith. Again, they devise a plan where they end up using their own resources to fulfill God's promise. And whenever we stop relying on, on God's power to fulfill what he said he was going to do, the product will always be something out of self-reliance. Our responsibility is to rest in God's promises. Our responsibility is to rest in God's sovereign grace. Because if we don't, we'll lack the freedom of ability to understand God's sovereign will for our lives. If we do, we'll lack the freedom of experiencing eternal joy because we've adopted another mindset without the ability to understand what is right. Only those who live by faith in God and rely on his provisions and, and his boundaries and not what we can achieve in our own will ever truly be free. As the psalmist would write when he says this, Psalms 119, he says, I will walk about in freedom for I have sought out your, your precepts, your, your structure, your boundaries, the, the same precepts that Christ embodied when he constrained himself and became human and finished the work in a place of total discomfort following the Father's will in total obedience and in total submission. And this has implications, ethical ones, for those of us who believe because grace creates the freedom for us to hear God and to respond to God, not with habitual fear, but with worship and with witness. And so I pray that we submit to God's guidance so that we can experience real freedom with the right restrictions, with the liberating restrictions, so that God can, can bless us and we can receive the blessings that God has for our lives as we're gathered into God's own life, into His own life in Jesus by the power of His Holy Spirit. Would you pray with me? Father, we come to you today with, with many, many pressures and many, many ambitions in our hearts. We've got a lot of aspirations to fulfill. But let this be our chief aspiration that we may live for Jesus and that he may redeem the works of our hands, the reins of our hearts, the thoughts of our minds. Father, shine on us with your grace and power into our darkness and liberate us, as Peter would write, into your marvelous light. We ask this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Well, hey, friends, thank you for watching. Uh, go ahead and like and subscribe this channel so you don't miss a single video or live stream. And remember, you can join me in person every Sunday at 10 a.m. Thank you for watching.